Hello and welcome. These are the solutions to activity five. Before we get into this activity, I want to share some information that should be uh, useful for both TAs and students as we get into uh, the next three chapters in the book, chapters four, five, and six. Those are going to be the three chapters that make up midterm two. If you look at the schedule, uh, midterm two is four weeks from midterm one. So we're going to get the rest of lecture this week and then three more weeks of lecture. Um, and so ideally that would give us you know, four weeks worth of recitations this week and then the next three weeks to help us prepare for uh, midterm two. There's this one obstacle in the way, and that's fall break. Fall break is Thursday and Friday, right before midterm two, which the only um, side effect is we'll miss recitations for those that meet on Thursday that week. And we also make Tuesday's recitation that week an ungraded activity just for the sake of having an equal number of graded sessions for uh, our classes. So we kind of have to get a little bit ahead. You know, if Tuesday recitations, we're going to have this Tuesday graded session tomorrow with really nothing that we've covered yet in chapter four, uh, we're going to have to introduce some of these materials to you, get a little bit ahead of lecture, but hopefully this will help you understand this content and lecture. Um, my guess will be that this activity won't be completed um, this week in recitation, but probably pushed into, you know, the, the last half of it probably in the next week. We can also take some midterm questions or just some review from midterm one. If you guys want to hear some of that in recitation this week, that's fine. But um, at the end of the day, we're going to have to get through, you know, three chapters in four weeks. And so we're going to probably have to work overdrive um, to try to get, you know, as much as we can out of recitation, just so that that extra hour we get every week of recitation is um, as beneficial as possible. When we get to the... Um, the week before the midterm, we'll have an activity for that ungraded week as well. I, I don't see more problems as being harmful. I think more problems is better. Um, so hopefully we can get through as many in class. And for the problems you can't do in class, you can at least um, have a video to help you through some of those problems. So you have an extra chance to see some problems and see solutions. You're also welcome to check out my daily quizzes where you have a variety of problems. As I think everybody knows, I think it's really useful to see problems, try them authentically, and check a key to see if you're right so you can get some feedback on your learning throughout the course. So right here we have um, what's known as a, a solubility chart. And if you've never seen this before, this is showing us the solubility trends for certain types of ions when they're forming ionic compounds. So this chart here is showing us the solubility guidelines for common soluble ionic compounds. And so common soluble ionic compounds contain nitrate, acetate, chloride, bromide, iodide, and sulfate ions. And so just about any cation paired up with these anions will make the compound be a soluble ionic compound. So again, let's picture taking something like sodium plus, pair that up with chloride, that's going to be soluble in water. When it's soluble in water, we usually write AQ for aqueous, for dissolved in water. And so sodium chloride will dissolve into water and it dissolves and separates into its plus and minus ions. You might remember, we've talked a lot about how ionic compounds are the repeating plus and minus. Well, when ionic compounds dissociate in water, each of these ions becomes surrounded by its own little water sphere. So these ions completely separate from each other, that's called ionization. And so the process by which ionic compounds dissolve in water is ionization. And so our soluble trends, again, nitrate acetates, soluble without any exceptions. So there's no metal cations that you're going to see paired up with nitrate or acetate that would make the compound be termed insoluble in water. Chloride bromide iodide, generally soluble, but we have three exceptions, silver plus, that pesky mercury one cation, and lead two plus. And one of the keys I want to stress here is not... HD2 plus. So HD2 plus is not an important exception. So let's look at what we mean here with chloride, bromide, iodide. What we mean is you can sketch or write the formulas of nine compounds for these ions here that are insoluble. Those would be AgCl, Br, and I. So AgCl, AgBr, AgI, lead, uh, chloride, bromide, and iodide, and then HG2 um, Br2, or excuse me, Hg2, Cl2, so like mercury 1 chloride, bromide, or iodide. All these compounds here are insoluble in water. Insoluble means they don't dissolve in water. So 
So AgCl in water would just be AgCl solid. It would just be a solid at the bottom of the test tube. Um, so AgCl solid, AgBr solid, AgI solid, etc. PbCl2. Now, it's important that we know a few details here that are useful for us. One is that for silver and lead, that these are the only common cations. Lead's a little weird in batteries and in some highly acidic conditions you can form lead 4+, plus, but it's very rare to be able to form lead 4+, plus in an aqueous solution of ordinary uh, preparation. So, practically speaking, Ag+, plus and lead plus, lead 2+, plus are the only cations of silver and lead that are, um, that are commonly seen in ordinary solutions. And then mercury is this weird one from nomenclature we probably recall that we can have mercury 1 or mercury 2. And it's just important. This is really why I was trying to get us to learn the nuance of mercury 1 verse 2 in chapter uh, 2 was so we can see here that mercury 1 salts insoluble, but mercury 2 salts exist and are completely soluble. So if you took AgCl2, mix it in water, it would dissolve into its ions. Um, and uh, likewise, if you took mercury 2 bromide, mercury 2 iodide also would be water soluble. But you can take any other cation with chloride bromide iodide would be water soluble. So calcium chloride, water soluble, copper chloride, water soluble. You know, you can write any metal cation you wish. It's going to be soluble. Now sulfate, our exceptions are strontium, barium, mercury 1, and lead 2 plus. Notice silver's not on this list. Um, you can see other books have slightly different solubility rules and guidelines. Solubility is actually not a fully yes or no. Like, there's a range of solubility just about every compound in water. The ones that we're listing here as insoluble are the ones that have a solubility so low that we just term them to be insoluble. You'll revisit this topic in Chapter 17 in probably much more greater detail than you'll ever wish to see, where you can actually look up, like, um, and you may have seen this before, uh, like equilibrium constants that relate to the solubility of compounds, and you'll go over um, that these insoluble compounds generally have a very small but negligible solubility in water, but they're so, so um, not soluble that we call them insoluble. That other um, ions tend to be in compounds that are often insoluble, so some ions form often compounds that are insoluble in water, and so those would be sulfide, uh, carbonate, phosphate, and hydroxide ion, so these ions here, when paired up with just about anything, make for an insoluble compound. Now we do have some exceptions. We have um, compounds of ammonia. So notice that ammonium salts are always water soluble here with these exceptions. So NH4 plus salts, always soluble. The alkali metal cations, oops, that these are also always water soluble. So notice that these all have the exception of the alkali cations. You can actually pair alkali cations with anything and they're always soluble. So I mean, I think they should be up here. I don't know why there's not an NH4 plus in the alkali cations as an always soluble with no exceptions, but that's generally the case, or not generally, that's specifically the case for those ions there's a sentence in the textbook that says just that, that NH4 plus and cations of the alkali metals always form soluble compounds with any anion that they can mix with. And then you see here, and this has been uh, in the book for as long as I can remember, I don't know why sulfide and hydroxide have two extra sets of exceptions. I don't know why they're separated this way, but they also have the exceptions of calcium, strontium, and barium. And these exceptions, you have to remember, are soluble. So these exceptions here make for water-soluble compounds, and all of the other cations you can mix with these ions would be insoluble. So calcium sulfide, I don't know why I'm in highlighter mode here, let me go back to pen. Calcium sulfide is soluble in water, so in water would be an AQ, completely dissolved into its two plus and two minus ions, whereas um, if we took copper sulfide, copper two sulfide would be an insoluble compound in water. Now, solid is just meant to imply, if we're mixing it into water, that it doesn't mix it all in water and doesn't ionize. Okay, so let's answer some questions with solubility. So KClO4 dissolves readily in water. What solute particles exist in solution? So when our ionic compounds dissolve in water, we get our ions that form, and the ions that form are those that kind of make up its name. So K plus dissolves into the water, and then ClO4 minus dissolves. So we get chlorate ion, 
or excuse me, perchlorate ion here into water, and we get K plus ion, each separated into separate water spheres. Imagine you take one mole of KClO4, we dissolve this, we get one mole of K plus, we get one mole of ClO4 ions, ClO4 minus ions. We write those AQ for each of these. So like one mole in Avogadro's number, we get an Avogadro's number of potassium cations where each of those cations has its own little water sphere in solution. So we get the ionization, the ionic compound completely breaks apart by its mutual attraction of those plus and minus ions with water. And so we should get this here. Now, option C, whenever we put this on a test, option C is often answered. Um, and there's really no dissolution of these ions into things like chloride and oxide ion. Like ClO4 minus, we name it because it's stable as that molecular ion. It tends to stay intact when it um, dissolves in water. The only thing that you tend to see, and this is more a topic for chapter 16 when you get there, is occasionally the ion that you form could react with water and it might pull an H plus off of water um, or it might donate an H plus to water if it has one to donate. But that's a much more complicated topic um, but we, you don't see the dissociation of things like nitrate into nitride ions in water. I mean, the ions that you learn how to name, these things stay intact. So the fact that we learn how to name perchlorate helps us hopefully recognize it in this compound and know that it's going to stay intact. Which compound is insoluble in water? Um, so this goes back to our solubility chart that the Hg2, 2, 2 plus, the mercury 1 salts, we have I minus, two of them for a two minus, so the HG2 collection is a two plus. The HG2, two plus is the exception, so this is insoluble in water. HGCl2, HG2 plus is not an exception. You can actually buy these two compounds here. You can buy mercury two chloride, you can buy mercury one chloride. They're stable enough, they both exist. They're real compounds, you can use them uh, in experiments. And the HGCl2 just has a much higher solubility in water. So Hg2 plus with the C uh, minus, two of them for the two minus. So the mercury two, this is just our ordinary soluble mercury two plus cation, not one of the exceptions. So only compound two is insoluble in water. Which compound here is soluble in water? Anything with potassium is water soluble. So that's, the, um, well, which compound is soluble in water? This one is soluble in water. Calcium carbonate. Calcium paired up with sulfide or hydroxide ion from our previous uh, solubility chart would be water soluble, not carbonate, not phosphate. So for carbonate, it's only the alkali and the ammonium cations that are soluble with carbonate. So for bromide, this is one of our insoluble exceptions for bromide. And then copper two hydroxide is not one of the exceptions that's soluble for hydroxide. So most hydroxide salts, including copper two plus, would be insoluble in water. So the only soluble compound here is K2SO3. Methanol, now, so when we look at like a liquid, so methanol is a liquid at room temperature. Liquids we usually term to either be miscible, meaning they mix in all proportions with water, or insoluble. Um, the solubility trends for like alcohols and water is a topic in chapter 13 later that you see in 1220. But methanol, we're, we're told here, is miscible with water. What solute particles exist in an aqueous solution of methanol? Well, methanol is not an acid. It's not a base. It, it really is just a, a molecule when it dissolves in water. So we just would have methanol molecules that are maybe surrounded by water, but no ionization. So we might have methanol mixed with water, where we have these droplets, some attraction between methanol and water molecules, but that's about it. So we're gonna have, um, we're going to have methanol particles in our solution. We're not going to have any formation of methoxide or H plus ion. In fact, I'm, I'd be surprised if you knew that was methoxide ion. That's what we, we, we would call this ion here. H plus does not fall off of methanol because methanol is not an acid. Now, how do you know methanol isn't an acid? Well, if it was an acid, I think we would have termed it as an acid in chapter two. So it's a little circular on how we might know methanol at this point isn't an acid, but it's an alcohol. Alcohols aren't particularly acidic. Um, and so because of that, it doesn't release this H plus ion into solution. 
It doesn't completely dissociate either, so it's not making some of these ions or all of a completely dissociating. Um, and so then the statement, no solute particles exist in the solution is not correct either. Anytime you dissolve anything in water, that substance is termed a solute. So a solute is just something dissolved in a solvent. Um, the uh, ionic compounds like NaCl we were talking about previously ionize, so they're ionizing solutes. We call those electrolytes because they allow a solution containing them to be conductive of electricity in a way water isn't. But methanol is not conductive at all. This is not, this does not form an electrolytic solution. So methanol is said to be a non-electrolyte in water. So no ions. And then no special conductivity. Now water is conductive enough. I often say this, don't go taking a bath with a toaster or anything stupid like that. But like water itself actually isn't that conductive of electricity. Um, you can make it much more conductive by adding um, um, ions to the solution. By adding a compound that dissolves and through the process of dissolving, you get ionization. Acetic acid is a weak acid. Um, a strong acid is something that completely dissociates. Let's talk about the difference. So HCl is an example of a strong acid. You can actually buy HCl gas. You can bubble this into water. Imagine taking a gas and just bubbling it through a sample of liquid water. And then what ends up happening is the HCl sticks into the water. And as it reacts with the water, you get ionization completely to H plus and the Cl minus. And so um, if you ever have seen a bottle of concentrated hydrochloric acid, I definitely don't recommend putting your nose up to the bottle. But if you waft or can smell a, a very faint smell of the, of the concentrated acid, you will smell HCl. You don't want to get a strong whiff. In fact, I don't even re recommend trying to waft it. If you happen to accidentally smell HCl concentrated as you're using it, it is the actual gaseous molecules floating out of the solution. Um, showing that if H plus and Cl minus recombined, then they kind of um, vaporize out of the solution. Okay, so we get complete ionization. HCl is a strong acid. We'll probably talk and define the other strong acids on a later slide, but HCl is a strong acid, meaning we get complete ionization to H plus and the Cl minus. Acetic acid is a weak acid, so we get partial ionization. So CH3, COOH, which you can actually get in pure form, kind of like methanol. You can have this pure liquid, add this to water, and what happens is we get some ionization. And I'm going to use this equilibrium arrow. Let me write this slightly bigger. In the equilibrium arrow, oh, that's not the way I want to write it. Equilibrium arrow, we write this way, and this way is going to signify that we can get some ionization, and we're going to get that to the ion we recognize, which is acetate. And then we can form H3O plus, or just write it as H plus, that these are kind of equal to each other and what they mean. Just say proton and H plus ion dissolved in water. And so this dissociation here just doesn't go to 100% completion. It goes to maybe 5 or 10% yield, depending on the concentration of the acetic acid molecule that we add to water. And the implication here is that if H3O plus or H plus bumps back into an acetate molecule, maybe it'll recombine into reactants. We have this dynamic equilibrium that's established. And so a solution of uh, acetic acid should contain some um, dissolved acetic acid molecules, intact, some ionized acetate and H plus ions. And we would get complete, like we would have answer C that would be true if acetic acid were a strong acid. But it's not a strong acid, only a weak acid. Now, recognizing weak acids is going to actually be pretty easy. If we look at all of those acids we learned how to name in Chapter 2, those are mostly our weak acids with the exception of um, seven of them. Seven of the acids we learned how to name seven acids will um, be known to be our strong acids. I think that's on a future slide, so I'll define those in a minute. Okay, so this slide here is a good one to talk about um, the strength of acids. So there's seven inorganic, and the only reason I stress this word inorganic here is these are the inorganic strong acids. There's a bunch of organic strong acids, so I don't want to imply that these are the only things possible in nature. 
that completely dissociate in water that release into H plus and their cation ion. But the um, seven strong acids are the chloride bromide iodide. And then, but importantly, not HF. Talk about that in a minute. Then we have um, the only diatomic acid um, or the only um, diprotic acid, H2SO4, on the list, so sulfuric acid. We'll talk about this in a minute too. That the first H only in, acetic, in, in, in uh, sulfuric acid is acidic. Um, HNO3, nitric acid. Let me write that three more clearly. So nitric acid, and then chloric acid, and then perchloric acid. Okay, a few things to talk about. Let's talk about the H2SO4 first H. So H2SO4 will react in water to form H plus and then HSO4 minus. And then HSO4 minus is actually a weak acid. It dissociates to about 10%. Again, it depends on the, on the concentration of solution. But we get about you know maybe five to ten percent ionization on the second step. We get a hundred percent ionization on the first step. So the strong electrolyte, because we're making ions, strong acid H2SO4 strongly ionizes once, hundred percent yield. So H2SO4 and all of our strong acids are strong electrolytes because they're making ions, and specifically calling them acids because one of the ions is H plus. So anything making H plus in solution is an acid. Completely making um, at least like a mole of acid per mole of compound dissolving into water makes something be a strong acid. Um, so let's talk about the HF here. So HF um, holds on to that H plus so strongly because fluoride has such a strong negative charge associated with it that that H plus is held on to really strongly and isn't easy for HF to lose that H plus in solution, um, but it will um, let it go and replace for other things such as um, bonds it can make with um, things like in your skin. HF is incredibly toxic, incredibly hazardous to work with. Um, of all of the um, acids on this page, I would probably say HF is by far the most hazardous compound to work with. And I only want to stress this, and I've stressed this before in this class, that even though it's not a strong acid, it is incredibly hazardous to work with. It takes incredibly um, um, careful work and training to use. So if you ever come across HF, you know, by far, you know, leave that um, for, for trained experts to use. That's not something that if you work in a research lab and you happen to see a bottle on the shelf, I doubt you ever will. Um, but um, it is not something to use lightly. Uh, perchloric acid is another thing that's actually pretty hazardous to work with. Just to know that um, if you work with chloric or uh, perchloric acid in particular, you have to be pretty careful with that as well. So that's not to suggest the other acids are easy to work with either. Um, they have uh, um, hazards as well. You will burn yourself chemically if you get all these acids on your skin. Um, you can uh, literally kill, uh, you know, die from HF getting on your skin. So, um, so the only one here that's not a strong acid is HF. So strong acid HCl, HClO3 is a strong acid. We just have to know these, if we know these seven strong acids, then we know all the other acids we learn how to name are weak acids. So it helps us understand which things are weak, well, the ones that aren't strong. Which solute particles exist in a solution of nitric acid? Well, if KNO3 would dissolve to K plus, dissolve into nitrate ion in water, so we get these aqueous ions here, HNO3 completely goes to H plus, and NO3 minus with 100% yield because HNO3 is a strong acid. So our solute particles in solution of nitric acid would be NO3 minus and H plus. Now you're gonna see this a lot. You're gonna see HNO3 AQ, that we write this a lot, that we just have to know that this is really H plus AQ and NO3 minus AQ. Question eight. One mole of each compound below is added to 10 liters of water. Which solution contains the most ions and is hence the most electrolytic? It would be the most conductive of electricity. Well, calcium chloride, this is water soluble. 
so meaning it dissolves in water, we get calcium 2 plus, two chloride ions. Potassium hydroxide is water soluble, we get K plus and hydroxide ion. Calcium phosphate is actually insoluble in water. So we add a mole of this to water, it remains insoluble. Okay, and so the most ions we're going to get here is through A. So we get the most, we get three moles of ions per mole of calcium chloride. So we get three moles of ions per 10 liters of solution. And here we'd only get two moles of ions. So more ions for A, and then effectively for C, we get zero moles of ions. Technically, it might dissociate to a very small amount. You might have a fraction of a mole, but a very, very small amount. And you'll see this more in chapter 17. Okay, so answer A, and they're not all equal. Which compound forms a basic solution when dissolved in water? We have one main prototype for um, a weak base, that's ammonia. Ammonia react. well, let's actually talk about strong bases for a minute. A strong base is the corollary to H plus to make water is hydroxide ion. So something like sodium hydroxide, which is water soluble, so this into water goes to sodium plus and hydroxide ion to 100% yield. It's the formation of something containing OH minus that makes something be termed a base, if it completely goes to 100% yield, it's a strong base. And so our strong bases are water-soluble ionic compounds with hydroxide ion. So if you remember all the exceptions for hydroxide ion, they would be the ammonium hydroxide, alkali hydroxides, and then calcium, strontium, barium hydroxide are water-soluble hydroxides that when they mix in water, make hydroxide ion. So those are strong bases. So a weak base is something like ammonia that partially reacts with water to form something like ammonium cation and hydroxide ion. If you haven't noticed, it's the H plus OH minus combined to form water. It's, you know, this is our acid, this is our base. So things that make acid, and, or things that release H plus or increase the H plus concentration in water are acids, things that increase the hydroxide ion concentration are things that we call, term a sub substance to be uh, a base. And this is an equilibrium too. Again, this equilibrium is part of chapter uh, 16 and into 17 as well. So you get this equilibrium back and forth for water um, into its ions, H plus and hydroxide ion. So we get this equilibrium here with ammonia. Ammonia is our prototypical weak base. So ammonia makes a weak base solution. Copper hydroxide is insoluble in water, so it doesn't dissolve. So no hydroxide ion added there. And methanol is not a base either. It can be aqueous. Now, this is a molecular compound, not ionic. So this is a non-electrolyte. So non-electrolyte doesn't dissociate into H+, doesn't dissociate into OH- either. So only ammonia will form a weakly basic solution. How many total ions are present in 75 mils of 1.25 moles per liter K2SO4? Okay, so if I have 1.25 moles per liter, if I multiply this by 0 0.075 liters, then that'll tell me so how many moles of K2SO4 there are. So I go 1.25 times 0.075. That would be 0 0.09375, two sig figs, moles of K2SO4. Well, what does K2SO4 do in solution? becomes two moles of K plus ions and then sulfide ion. And so one mole of this goes to three moles of ions. So that should correspond to 0.28 moles of solute particles. 150 mils of 1.25 molar K2SO4 is in a one uh, liter volumetric flask. And then the flask is filled to the mark with water. What's the concentration of the solution? And so here we have 0.150 0 liters times 1.25. Now M just means mole per liter. So it's 1.25 moles of that solute per liter of that solution. So 
for our volume cancels, 0.15 times 1.25, that gives us 0 0.1875 moles of K2SO4 that are in this flask. And then we end up diluting it to one liter, so the new volume of that solution is one liter. Concentration of K2SO4, this is means concentration of what's inside of it, in moles per liter would be 0 0.1875 moles of K2SO4, the three six figs, and then divide that by the thousand liters. So it'd be 0 0.188 mole per liter. So what we've done here is we've diluted the K2SO4 solution. We did a dilution problem. Now we end up learning a dilution equation, M1V1 equals M2V2, MIVI equals MFVF is another way of writing this. And so we can take the M1V1, 150 times 1.25, and then divide by V2, 1,000 milliliters. We just want to use a common unit or convert this to liters, one of the two. So M1V1 equals M2V2, or M2 would come out to be the same answer. So another approach, I mean, the equations are nice, but the thought of just taking the moles of the solute and then changing the total volume is also pretty easy. All right, so let's, let's look at this problem here. How much uh, potassium uh, KHCO3, potassium hydrogen carbonate, in grams must be added to completely neutralize 250 milliliters of 1.0 molar H2SO4? At first glance, this might look like a tricky problem, but this is really very similar to problems from uh, chapter uh, chapter 3. So this is really just a stoichiometry problem. And so we want to neutralize specifically 0 0.2500 liters 0 0.2500 liters of 1.00 mole per liter mole H2SO4 per liter of solution. Every time we see this, we think mole of that per liter, we're going to be better off. So the volume cancels. So this is a quarter of a mole of H2SO4. And so what would we think? It's going to take twice as many moles of KHCO3. How many grams will that correspond to? Well, it's 100 grams per mole. Half a mole, it's going to be 50 grams. Okay, so see, we can do a dimensional analysis, or excuse me, a uh, stoichiometry problem, just where we're taking, using dimensional analysis, or the thought of dimensional analysis of how much H2SO4 is present, how much KHCO3 needs to be added, and then 100 grams per mole, half a mole, 50 grams. Which compound does F have an oxidation number zero? Oxidation numbers um, are one of the last things we talk about in this chapter. They're kind of the thought of charge for ionic compounds. Uh, for molecular compounds, it's related to charge. It helps us establish the partial positive atom versus the partial negative atom. We'll talk about that more in chapter eight. Um, ClF3, F goes minus, so chlorine here goes positive. F is always minus in compounds, so in, in um, molecules with other elements, always goes to minus one. And then in F2, it's zero. So in elemental form, elements have oxidation numbers of zero. So sodium without a charge would be zero oxidation number, zero charge. So elements are zero. And then lastly, what's the oxidation number of carbon in CaCO3? Well, we know this is a 2 plus calcium. We know oxygens um, should be an oxidation number minus 2. doesn't mean that carbonate has an oxide ion in it. It just means the oxidation number of bookkeeping system for charge is minus 2, minus 6 for the collection. So plus 4 minus 6 equals the charge of carbonate of minus 2. So we go plus 4, so plus 2, plus 4 is plus 6 minus six to balance out the charge in the molecule to be overall neutral for the molecule. If we look at carbonate, we want carbonate to be two minus, minus two, minus six, so plus four. All right, that's all for this, oh, sorry. One, one more question. At which compound below does O have an oxidation number of minus one? So we have plus one minus two. We have plus one 
and then minus one for the two O's, so that's minus a half for each. H2O2 plus one plus two for the two hydrogens, minus two for the two O's, so that's minus one for the O's. Now titanium here, that's not peroxide, that's just titanium oxide with a minus two charge. So that's TiO2, just ordinary oxide, minus four, titanium plus four. And that completes the activity. Thanks for the attention.